It's day three of reading the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, for the It Had to Be Said book club. I first read this book like 15 or 20 years ago, and since then I've been studying stuff like history, politics, and economics, so I thought I'd revisit this book with more knowledge under my belt. I didn't have much to say about chapter two, so I'm sparing you the details and boiling it down to the difference between assets and liabilities, which is that assets make you money and liabilities cost you money. So a car is a liability, while a stock that pays dividends is an asset. There, just saved you an hour of reading. Let's read chapter three, and we'll talk about what assets really are. The first part of the chapter is about Ray Kroc and McDonald's, and uh, it, you know, it says that um, Ray Kroc's business is real estate because the whole point of McDonald's is not just you know supplying burgers, and they're not even the best at making burgers; they just have the best real estate. So that's his business, and that's uh, the first part of what he says: mind your business, mind your own business. Uh, mind the business that's, you know, making you money. Mind all your assets. Uh, let's go from here. The previous chapter presented diagrams illustrating that most people work for everyone but themselves. <laughs> that's undeniable. They work first for the owners of the company, then for the government through taxes, and finally work for the bank that owns their mortgage, or the landlord. When I was a young boy, we didn't have a McDonald's nearby. Wow, you must be old. Yet my rich dad was responsible for teaching Mike and me the same lesson that Ray Kroc talked about at the University of Texas. It's secret number three of the rich. That secret is mind your own business. Financial struggle is often directly the result of people working all their lives for someone else. Many people will simply have nothing at the end of their working days to show for their efforts. Yeah, well, that's true. Good diagnosis of the individual financial struggle. Our current educational system focuses on preparing today's youth to get good jobs by developing scholastic skills. I mean, I'm not entirely convinced it's even about preparing them to get good jobs. I think as much as anything, it's preparing them to get the most basic service sector jobs. But uh, sure, I mean, maybe if they go to to really posh schools, maybe then they get uh, they get told that they're being prepared for the highest jobs in the highest offices. Their lives will revolve around their wages, or as described earlier, their income column. Many will stutter, study further to become engineers, scientists, cooks, police officers? There's not a lot of study there. Artists, writers, and so on. These professional skills allow them to enter the workforce and work for money. But there's a big difference between your profession and your business. Often I ask people, what's your business? And they'll say, well, I'm a banker. Then I ask them if they own the bank, and they usually respond, no, I work there. In that instance, they've confused their profession with their business. Their profession may be a banker, but they still need their own business. Well, okay, so most people don't have their own business. I mean, <laughs> that's clear. So, like, what's your business? Well, I don't have one, should be the normal answer, unless you're talking to really rich people. A problem with school is that you often become what you study. So if you study cooking, you become a chef. If you study the law, you become an attorney, and the study of auto mechanics makes you a mechanic. The mistake is becoming what you study is that too many people forget to mind their own business. They spend their lives minding someone else's business and making that person rich. Well, that's what a job is. <clears throat> I mean, that's the whole point of a job. And actually, we're kind of going to see that in a minute. And and he doesn't... He There's no solution for jobs. His solution is that you should start owning businesses and everybody else should work for you. Which is cool, you know, for you, but it doesn't make things any better for anybody else. And that's why I don't really like, you know, these messages anymore. It's, it's the crab in the bucket mentality, you know, like, like in this system, not all the crabs can get out of the bucket, right? They have to stand on each other 
to get out. So yeah, you can achieve some degree of financial independence, but you have to step on a lot of people to get there. To become financially secure, a person needs to mind their own business. See, he's a bit repetitive in this book. That's why I try to save you a few pages here and there. Your business revolves around your asset column, not your income column. As stated earlier, the number one rule is to know the difference between an asset and a liability and to buy assets. See, that, that's the whole chapter two in a nutshell in that, in that sentence. That's why they don't need a chapter two. The rich focus on their asset columns while everyone else focuses on their income statements. That's why I hear so often, I need a raise. If only I had a promotion. I'm going back to school to get more training so I can get a better job. I'm going to work overtime. Maybe I can get a second job. In some circles, these are sensible ideas, but you're still not minding your own business. These ideas all still focus on the income column and will only help a person become more financially secure if the additional money is used to purchase income generating assets. Uh huh. Let's uh, skip ahead and look at what he means by that. That's what I care the most about because. You know, in, in the last chapter, we, we got that assets make you money, right? Well, okay, so let's look at uh, what he means by that, okay? Here, here's his examples. First, businesses that do not require my presence. Okay, so this is what I have a problem with, okay? I own them, but they are managed or run by other people. If I have to work there, it's not a business, it becomes my job. So basically, if you have enough money um you know you you don't need to do any work you get other people to do the work other people make the money for you see that's how i mean that's basically how people make make so much money and the way they talk about it is very impersonal you know it's like this thing just generates revenue for my corporation you know and and it all feeds into my asset column but what what's really going on is people are working at the jobs he's saying you know they shouldn't be working at but they're working for him so it's good see when you've got all the money you can keep all the money except for you know, uh, uh, you know the the basic salaries of a few people. You know, like how is <laughs> like we we just consider it all legitimate. You know, like oh well, you were you were smart. No, really, he just knows how the system works, and he uses it. But the system is based on violence, and this is a perfect example because you can only own something that you th as an absentee if it's protected by the law and the police so like but but that's it that's become the only thing like you own it because the law says you own it and you've got the state to back you up but like what what about any of this is legitimate that's that's the question that i ask nowadays like how is that okay why is it legitimate that um you know other people work for you and you take most of the money and of course we know like money it leads to power so of course people with all the money control the governments and pass the laws and so on so like you know obviously the system works for them right and it works against everybody else and and when you don't stress that enough um you're you're complicit in the propaganda all right stocks and bonds i mean these are kind of the same in a sense because stock is just ownership in part of a company that does not require your presence that has nothing to do with you so other people are working you know to uh, to raise the price of your stock or churn out a dividend um, and bonds um i mean bonds and notes I mean, that's just stuff that people owe you. That's when people owe you money. <laughs> um, you can, again, you can read David Graeber's book on debt for that if you want. Um, income generating real estate. Again, this is a, such a big problem. It, like, rich people use words like income generating real estate when what they mean is 
tenants who have to pay them regularly in order to be allowed a place to live. And if that doesn't sound, yeah, if that sounds like normal and, and what's the problem to you, then just realize that people own places and you have to pay them to live there. I want you to explain what exactly, you know, is legitimate about that. What is the logic behind that? All it really means is I had more money than you to start with. So I was able to buy a place and rent it out. And you don't have enough money to buy your own place. So you have to rent from somebody. So you have to pay regular rent. But I just, I just can't see how any of this is legitimate. See, it's how the system works. Yes, but it's a call. Like, I think. This kind of thing is an op when you really think about what these things are, what they mean, and question their legitimacy, you start to see why I think that the whole system needs to be destroyed. Because it's such a bullshit system. Why is this okay? Why is this legitimate? This is what we should be rising up against. Not reading it and going, oh, that could be me. Because in, in, on the one hand, it could be you. And on the other hand, it probably won't be you. Um, and the last thing, again, just another kind of legal fiction, royalties from intellectual property. Um, it's, it's another law. I mean, it's, it's just like the property law. It enables, uh, you know, a few people to make huge amounts of money and other people not. And it's one thing if it's like, like, the examples here like music and scripts and stuff like that then yeah okay then you're probably an artist and that's you know that's the thing that you do that is your job maybe um and and a lot of patents sure some people are just inventors as their job good for them they'll need those patents but a lot of patents are for like uh, life-saving drugs so that they can raise the price sky high so that if you need that life-saving drug oh too bad screw you loser you don't get it you can't afford it so you're gonna have to die and that's very much the case of everything i mean there was a headline just yesterday in i don't know i don't know which newspaper um saying that like tons of homeless people have been dying already uh, in north america because of the heat you know just because of the heat there's tons of property all around that they could be in that would that would be cooler you know that that would have helped them survive <laughs> like they could have survived they could have been in a mall for example a nice air-conditioned mall but no they're poor so they're not allowed um but you know the people who own the mall they've got plenty of money they've got plenty coming in that's income generating real estate you know that's Businesses that don't require their presence, they've got money coming in while people die outside. And that's really the reality of the legal system, the property system, systems of ownership. And that's, you know, like it just, there's not enough emphasis on that. That's why I have to stress these things. Um, as a young boy, my educated dad encouraged me to find a safe job. But my rich dad encouraged me to begin acquiring assets that I loved. If you don't love it, you won't take care of it. I kind of wonder if... I, I want to know how you can love, like, a business that you, that you don't even actually work in. How you can love owning property or owning stock. I mean, it's, it can be interesting... But I think you're kind of fooling yourself if you say you love it. Like, or what exactly do you love? The thrill of winning or of gaining more money? I mean, what exactly is it? Again, this is part of the problem. That things like, you know, like, you're, you're, you're told to, like, do what you love and stuff. And that's why people get jobs that don't pay very well. Because they're trying to do what they love. And you can't even love that because... It's a job, and so there are all kinds of restrictions on you, um, and you still can't do what you want. Um, it's so hard in this economy, in this system, 
to, to do what you want, to find anything you want. I collect real estate simply because I love buildings and land. What? I love shopping for them. I could look at them all day long. When problems arise, the problems aren't so bad that it changes my love for real estate. For people who hate real estate, they shouldn't buy it. <laughs> I don't get it. I don't get what any of that is. But, like, okay, great, so you love real estate, but what does it mean exactly to own real estate? It means kicking everybody else off until they pay. So, you're trying to own land. And let's also bear in mind that, um, like, I, I'm sorry if this seems irrelevant, but he is living on colonized land, right? Um, like, I don't know if he still lives in Hawaii, but, you know, like, Rich Dad did. You know, that's where he grew up. Hawaii is, is a very colonized place. And, you know, like, Native Hawaiians have it bad because of their colonial situation. Um, you go around trying to own all of their land, and it's, it's that much worse for them. You know? And look at Zuckerberg. Didn't he buy, like, a whole island or half an island or something? And obviously, a lot of the natives there hate him for it because it's like, that's supposed to be our land. And you just come here with this whole different sense of ownership, this this European legal sense of ownership, and just say, this is mine now and you're not allowed there. I'm going to do whatever I want there. Um, maybe turn it into income generating real estate. Um, it's it's just mine now, you know. So, so like, what part of this is okay? You know, it needs to be fought against, not encouraged. Whatever. I also love stocks of small companies, especially startups, because I'm an entrepreneur, not a corporate person. Um, in my early years, I worked for Standard Oil, the Marine Corps, and Xerox. I enjoyed my time with those organizations and have fond memories, but deep down, I'm not a, a company man. I like starting companies, not running them. So my stock buys are usually of small companies. Yeah, that's cool and all, although that's the, also a great way to lose your shirt. <laughs> I mean, it all depends. I don't know. I have a friend who, uh, who basically does that, too. Sometimes I even start the company and take it public. Fortunes are made in new stock issues, and I love the game. Many people are afraid of small cap companies and call them risky, and they are. But that risk is diminished if you love what the investment is, understand it, and know the game. Well, okay, but that risk is virtually eliminated if the business has some, hu some super rich, high-profile backer behind it, like Robert Kiyosaki, you know, so like he, you know, it's a small, it's a small business. He, he can go in, he, you know, his, his assistants can make or break a company like that. Like, yeah, I'm sure he looks for people who are dedicated and know what they're doing. Like, that's really important. You have to have the right people, right? Um, but like, but then they can go like, yeah, can we have like $20 million to, uh, you know, to start up or something? And he could say, yes, here you go, you know, easily. So like, that's another thing about this book. Like it never comes in what an enormous, or at least not that I remember, what an enormous advantage economies of scale are, you know? So that if you have huge amounts of money already, like, yeah, of course, um, the businesses that you support have a really good chance of, of, of winning, you know, like, yeah, the ones you pick and now you own them and you're going to get even richer off them, you know? And it's like, you know, why don't you say that? <laughs> why aren't you talking about that? Because you, you don't think of it that way. With small companies, my investment strategy is to be out of the stock in a year. Yeah, see, he's like in and out in a year. On the other hand, my real estate strategy is to start small and keep trading up for bigger properties and therefore delay paying taxes on the gain. See, this allows the value to increase dramatically. I generally hold real estate less than seven years. Mm -hmm, whatever. Yeah, just hold real estate. Mm -hmm. 
So the meat and bones of the uh, of his argument is uh, kind of in the next paragraph, so I'll start here. I don't encourage anyone to start a company unless they really want to. Knowing what I know about running a company, I wouldn't wish that task on anyone. Yeah, exactly. And so you say, mind your business, and everyone's like, oh, you should just start your own business. It's not that easy. I mean, it's really, really hard. It takes tends to take a lot of money, depending what you want to do. Um, and in fact, it might take a team of like accountants and lawyers and stuff too. Um, I mean, yeah, people like Kiyosaki have the money for that, but not everybody does. There are times when people can't find employment and starting a company seems like the best solution. But the odds are against success. Nine out of ten companies fail in five years. Right, and there's a bunch of reasons for that. And they, one is that they just don't have the money behind them. Of those that survive the first years, nine out of ten of those eventually fail as well. So only if you really have the desire to own your own company do I recommend it. Otherwise, keep your day job and mind your own business. Right, so so no, so don't start your own business, you know, unless you love it. Do one of the other things that'll build your asset column. I mean, yeah, it's not too hard, for example, to buy stock. Stocks and bonds. Like, yeah, those are, that's not a very hard thing. But those don't bring in a lot of money. And you can lose money off those just as easily as you can gain it. And nowadays, I mean, stock markets are in turmoil. There's, I, I mean, it's possible that this is just a kind of uh, a correction. It could be the slow decline. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I kind of think in 20 years, the stock market, I don't know, will it even exist anymore? Because, you know, there's a lot, a lot of things that are going to happen. A lot is going to change in the next 20 years, especially because of climate change. But not only because of climate change. There are going to be huge political and economic changes in that time, too. And I don't think owning stock is much of an investment. I don't think having money is going to be very useful by then. But we'll see. You never know. It's a strong system, so you never know. When I say mind your own business, I mean to build and keep your asset column strong. Yes, you've said that hundreds of times. Once a dollar goes into it, never let it come out. Think of it this way. Once a dollar goes into your asset column, it becomes your employee. Well, really, it, it goes to fund employees. Your employees who will work for you to make you more money. The best thing about money is that it works 24 hours a day and can work for generations. Keep your day job, be a great hardworking employee, but keep building that asset column. <laughs> this is, this has got a problem. I've got a problem with this too. It can work for generations. Yes, wealth tends to get passed down through the generations, which is why families, rich families and rich people tend to just stay rich. They don't let go of that money. As your cash flow grows, you can indulge in some luxuries. An important distinction is that rich people buy luxuries last, while the poor and middle class tend to buy luxuries first. Yeah, I mean, this is kind of basic money management, right? Like, it's true that if you want to save your money or, or get rich, you know, maybe don't buy so many luxuries. But most people do not have the prospect of getting rich and and can't you know save that kind of thing you know so luxuries are just their way of enjoying their lives or their way of maybe surviving in this harsh world you know i mean for a lot of people luxuries are like cigarettes <laughs> like you like it's the the one thing you can't really afford that you don't need but you kind of need it so you know so you still have to get it, right? The poor and middle class often buy luxury items like big houses, diamonds, furs, jewelry, or boats because they want to look rich. Yeah, that is a big problem. But my point is that I kind of think everybody already knows that if they want to get rich, <laughs> that they shouldn't be buying jewelry and, and houses they can't afford and stuff. Um, 
like I'm not sure how to explain to somebody that you shouldn't buy a house that you can't that you will never be able to afford to pay with uh, to pay for um like I don't know how to tell someone that because they should already know it I don't get how they don't already know that you know if they've done it there's a reason for it like they're hoping that they will be able to afford it that that it'll bring the cost down after all we're always getting told that buying is cheaper long term than renting right so i mean they try to buy a house and maybe they got suckered into it maybe there was somebody i mean that happened all the time in the the 2000s which led to the 2007 2008 uh, real estate crash right when when like thousands of people lost their homes or, or i don't know how many millions maybe um because like some guy tricked them into signing on the dotted line and i mean you you could say that it wasn't tricked that they that they signed of their own free will but there's no way that they read all that fine print they just thought that they were getting a loan to be able to afford a house you know that's what they were told so that's where they signed and you can say oh financial education in school would have solved that but i don't think it would have because there's no way that they would have spent any time in school on like pages and pages of fine print you know only like lawyers and stuff understand that kind of thing see they look rich but in reality they just get deeper in debt on credit right that's right um but then but then that's another problem too that everything's available on credit and there are high interest rates and like you know for a lot of people they have to buy on credit i mean yeah it's different if you're buying furs and jewelry and stuff yeah but like but some people just the only way they can afford something is on credit and then next thing you know they're bankrupt the old money people the long-term rich build their asset column first well they already have asset columns i mean if you if you're old money then you can just buy assets you can just buy this is my new assets you know <laughs> like this is a new building i just bought you know cost me 0.01 percent of my uh of my wealth uh, then the income generated from the asset column buys their luxuries the poor and middle class buy luxuries with their own sweat blood and children's inheritance <laughs> so now it's their fault that their children don't have any money too see it's all about blaming the poor and again i mean on the surface these things this is correct but like there are reasons for it and just scolding them for it you know doesn't it's not addressing the problem a true luxury is a reward for investing in and developing a real real asset for example, when my wife Kim and I had extra money coming from our apartment houses, she went out and bought her Mercedes. It didn't take any extra work or risk on her part because the apartment house bought the car. She did, however, have to wait four years while the real estate investment portfolio grew and began generating enough extra cash flow to pay for the car. But the luxury, the Mercedes, was a true reward because she proved she knew how to grow her own asset column. The, that car now means a lot more to her than simply another car. It means she used her financial intelligence to afford it. Well, okay. Is it really financial intelligence to own a building and make people pay to live there? Is that really financial intelligence? Is it like she's so smart that like she managed to find out this this cool hidden way is it maybe a hidden way that people don't know about making money um no she basically just said well here's one way that i can use my wealth to make more wealth um and that was by getting tenants to pay you every month so she's the new landlady now so I mean is that intelligence do you see my problem with this book 
it's it's disguising um, what's just taking money from people for, for existing, for for needing or for needing to work, and saying, you know, this is my not only is this my money now, and I'm going to do whatever the hell I want with it, but it's financial intelligence to be able to do that. No, it's just having more money than they do and using that money to to make even more money. So that's chapter three. Intelligence is having more money than others and poor people are poor because they buy too many luxuries and don't just own stuff. See you next time for chapter four.